So you want to be a ranger then, do you? Welcome, one and all. Going to talk about the armaments that a particular ranger might be taking with them on adventuring. I'll preface this and say that we're going to be talking some of the historical uh, context side of it, so getting some idea from history and what they might have used, but you know, we're also explaining some of the what we generally think of medieval fantasy, popularized by Dungeons and Dragons. I have my player's handbook right here, hope you can see that in there. But for all intents and purposes, I am going to be using the term ranger as my word to define these certain characters. In the historical side, they might be called longbowmen, which is sort of like their job, like say if they're on a military campaign, you might call them like yeomen, but that was more like a status in society. But you know, just bear with me, for all intents and purposes, I'm going to be using the term ranger to describe these two. Uh, if there comes a point where I need to make a distinction between the historical side and the medieval fantasy side, I'll try to remember and bring that up. It's like, hey, I'm specifically referring to like these type of people, but I'll be using the word ranger throughout this video to mean both. With that, here we go. We all kind of have this idea in our minds of what the ranger sort of looks like and what their job kind of is, which, you know, speaking of jobs, if you haven't seen the uh, previous video that I put up about medieval foresters, I uh, highly recommend that. It kind of mentions the ranger as sort of like a position in the forestry that they took place back there. And so I recommend seeing that. But, you know, we kind of have this image of them, you know, they're all like cloaked in green. They, you know, they have, have their long bows, they're out in the woods, and they, you know, they protect the wilderness. Which, you know, to be fair, that would definitely be a case, you know, that they have, they have these more rugged individuals that they survive out there. But let's say that there is a, a kingdom that happens to go to war with another, against another kingdom, that, you know, there would be sometimes where these rangers would be called upon to help along with the main army going into, and like, how would they help in that situation? How would they function differently than like the main common soldier, per se? What exactly sets them apart and makes them different? What, why would they be brought along? Well, you know, some people would say that, you know, they're fantastic archers, which I think definitely would be a case to consider, that yes, that their skill in archery to help supply cover for people as they're trying to, like, say, storm the castle, if it were, if it was, you know, like a, an, a pitched battlefield, you know, they could lay the, you know, cover fire or the first volleys to help take out soldiers. But the one thing that I think is kind of uh, missing in this narrative equation is kind of hidden in the name of these people called the ranger and that they can range all over that they have this ability that they can just pick up whatever few belongings that they have they're all light and efficient and can go out into whatever place they need to be and survive and live on their own and take care of themselves and it's their i guess we could say their mobility is what sets them apart because if you have like say the main army going on to the warpath they need to have these roads and supply wagons and everything to help move them along the position whereas these rangers no they're fine they can go all go off the off the beaten path shall we say that's where their rugged frontiersman life comes in where like they excel in and it was kind of interesting learning about this stuff where in certain historical cases where these rangers being uh, supplied by the, the king would actually send them out ahead of time in front of the main army. So let's say if there was like a patch of area that they needed to clear out of the way to like get from point A to point B much quicker as opposed to circumventing the road that was all the way, if we can just get cut through here and get to our destination quicker, well then, then they would send them out ahead of time and sort of clear the area so that the main army could come on through and arrive at their destination, destination quickly. So with the idea of mobility being the main part of the equation that were, that is I am considering a part of this, so what particular type of gear, you know, would they take with them on their, you know, expedition or their adventuring that they would need to? Well, besides, you know, like the main satchel that they would have, uh, I might show you this eventually what's in here, but this would be the, the basic amenities that they would need on them. But what sort of weapons would they be using? Because that's kind of what this kind of 
is all about, more like the, the, the weapons and armor that they would particularly use. And as far as armor is concerned, the trying to be light and as efficient as possible, I do think that the cloth gambeson, from what we see from the historical context, rules. Like, that's what we see in historical context, is kind of what we see in medieval fantasy, and from my logical analysis, yes, being the idea of being up close in melee is not super high on the uh, list of rangers, you know, worries right now. They're predominantly ranged, as far as we think. Again, we're talking about forestry rangers here. It's funny, when we change the terrain and forests are out of the equation, it changes it a little bit, but we'll talk about that later. But the idea of having some form of armor that can help uh, protect, you know, from some incoming arrow fire, would that be the predominant damage that you might be in fear of? And why you would want to have a full male armor, which are those, the, that's the, like, the steel rings, you know, because we call it something we call it chain armor. I, and just by the way, please do not refer to it as chain mail. It's, it's a bit of a redundant sentence, you're just saying the same thing over again, so it's, just, it's male armor, that's the most common. You can call it chain armor as well, but if you say chain mail, you're just saying the same word over and over again. Like for instance, I know uh, my hobbies is woodworking, so people ask me, well I am a woodworking carpenter. It's like, you're just saying the same thing, yeah, it's the same thing with, with chain mail. Anyway, side note, it's a little pet peeve of mine, but moving on. So we're out in the forest. Or just you know the, called the wilderness and we need to have our gear be able to uh, defend ourselves you know like if we happen to see the enemy trying to sneak thrown through we can take care of them we need to be able to hunt and forage you know to help to, to, to sustain us and yet we also need to have our gear to be able to help clear brush and everything so that we can help support the army if they're trying to get through so what type of gear would we have well, I do believe that history, as well as the medieval fantasy aspect of it, gets it right, and that the bow is one of the best weapons to have for the ranger. It's just to be able to take care of the enemy from a distance when you're in the woods. Uh, the idea of having much physical confrontation in the woods is a bit difficult. The, with just having all that tree and shrub, especially if it's not very cleared out, it's very hard to swing around swords over in that dense arrow, you know, but be able to like take a position and they might be able to pick off a shot with an arrow much easier. You can also hunt with this as well, of the occasional like squirrel or rabbit to help uh, feed you. I don't know why you would need to hunt a deer per se, unless you know you were actually part of a you know traveling group or hey you know like an adventuring party, shall we say? Then you know like the deer might be able to help feed you and your group for like a day or two. But, you know, just the odd, you know, squirrel or rabbit would be enough to help feed you there. So, yes, by far, the bow, I think, one of the best picks. So, you know, that's what history has kind of showed us, and when we think of video fantasy, that's generally what we see. So, A-plus on there. That takes care of predominantly the ranged weapons, but in an okay, what happens when it gets uh, up close and personal, and the, the distance is close and we need to get into melee? What sort of weapons would we have? I'm gonna go ahead and put the bow down here for a bit. Put that right there. And talk about certain melee weapons we have. Well, right here, the general uh, historical side, we generally see the arming sword. This is particularly popular in England, but then talking about you know cultural uh, appropriation and you know this is what society standards are, we know that in Germany, towards the uh, the higher uh, middle ages. The, that the falchion was very popular, and so probably in that region, the falchion would be probably the more common sidearm that they would have. But you know, as, you know, much of the stuff that we get and the images that we see is from England and France, you know, coming from there. And there, in those regions, the arming sword was very popular. Uh, this is actually a little bit longer than what an actual arming sword is. The more appropriate length of sword would be more something like this. Let's see if I can. Show that up to you guys to see the difference in length right there, particularly the blade. You know, so there's, so this is, this would be, you know, like the more actual length, so it's a little bit longer, but this is sort of like the more profile that we think. This is a, a foam LARP version, by the way, same as this. And, so see if I can put that back there. 
Yeah, there. Behave. There we go. Put that there. So this is the typical weapon that we generally see that depicted as what, also the records of what they are to bring along with them. So when the king gives the order something like, hey, so he's sending words to his knights saying that I need, you know, I need these many men at arms, I need these many rangers, I need this to help supply so that you can supply it, and so that as all these lords help supply these men, and when they all come together, suddenly they have, you know, like 20,000, and we have the army together. So then we get the call, so like, hey, the rangers, we're going to war. Oh, well, I need to bring my sword with me. This is the typical weapon that we kind of see right there. However, we do need to consider that trying to be as light and efficient as possible, while this is great for combat, in the use of trying to, in the utilitarian purposes, you know, the clearing brush, does this weapon work good in utilizing that purposes? Not really, actually. This is kind of terrible for trying to get rid of tree limbs and whatnot. So while the sword may be great in one aspect, it's not in the other. So if the sword is not, may not be the best weapon to be carrying into battle to handle the utilitarian purposes of clearing the forest area if needed to, well, what other options are mentioned in the historical context? Well, we kind of have two that we have. The first one is the axe. I want to say this is not a typical battle axe that most people think of. This is the smaller uh, hatchet tomahawk-like axes, particularly because the head of the axe is a bit more heftier and is able to help uh, split uh, wood a lot easier. There are battle axes that have the head a little more slim, tapered profile so that it can easily slice through flesh. Not very good for chopping wood. So we're talking about like the smaller, you know, hatchet style axes. Some even have kind of a name that some of the people prefer them as like the archer's axe. So, you know, hey, there you go. Also, it's, you know, like smaller, lighter, more compact. You can like have it on your boss. So, you know, it's like a win-win for everybody. However, while the axe is mentioned, and I think that it could definitely be like a good uh, tool to help clear stuff, and you know, it's an efficient weapon, there are a couple things to consider that may not be the best option for a ranger. While yes, it is definitely one of the main tools we think of, of let's say a woodsman, you know, like was, uh, uh, when we think of that, you know, like he has his axe with him. We we'll probably generally think of like the bigger, longer axe, you know, like with two hands and he's going to go out to town. But, you know, like for us, the ranger, we need the smaller one. But if you think about it, there is a limited amount of contact area, shall we say. And what I mean by that is, let's say we pull the sword out here again. Set this down here. On regarding the sword, the entire length of the blade is a weapon. So that even though I am swinging the sword and I'm, you know, generally aiming for like this area, generally like two-thirds, three-fourths area to make contact. If I overswing or something happens and you know that instead of hitting here, I'm actually hitting more closer here, well, you know, I can still do the amount of damage. And even if I underswing or they, you know, kind of dodge out of the way, but you know, it still grazes from the tip, you know, I can still cut if I needed to. Now take that into consideration with the axe. There's the only amount of damage right here is right here. So that I am having to aim for a specific target, whether it be like a tree limb or a human limb, okay, that I am trying to aim for a specific target right here. And if I overswing, okay, you know, I might be able to like do a little bruising, whatever, with the, the handle, the shaft of the axe there. And if I underswing, well, then I miss completely. So, in the use of, uh, of course, you know, in the form of the utilitarian purposes, the tree isn't going to move. So, you know, like, I can take my time with the tree because I know that I can hit and aim it right there. With a human, they're kind of dodging around, not wanting to get hit. So it's a little bit more difficult with this. So this is why in utilitarian, you know, I think it would be great. But, you know, for combat, you know, mm, taking your pick, you know, like, is this really the best option per se? Well, we do have another option that was quite popular in uh, the in the records, the historical records. And what do we have here? 
we have what is called a bill hook. This is my one that I have right here. This is a your average uh, farmer or woodsman's brush tool that like kind of like the early version of a machete. This is what they would do to help you know trim the areas of their yard or like the farmstead, whatever they need to. And yeah, this is what they would use. Sometimes it would have a little longer handle. Sometimes the blade would be a little bit longer. Sometimes more of a shallow curve, or sometimes it would be a really pronounced uh, hook right there. But you know, this is generally what it would look like. And this kind of solved the issue of the axe problem that we had, and that we have an entire blade now that we can use. So that if we uh, over uh, extend a little bit, you know, we can still get a cut in there if we need to. And if we underswing, well, you know, we can still grab from that hook and still try and do some damage right there. But also, this is a fantastic tool. I mean, this is kind of what it was used for to help clear, you know, limbs. I don't, as far as like actual trees itself, it might be a little bit taking some time to get through with something like this. Again, this would probably still excel in that. But as far as your average uh, Joe going through trying to, to clear a path right here, this would be fantastic. I think there would probably be like a cord uh, from the handle that would be able to hang from your belt right there. And also you could loop your hand through that so that you could have more security instead of would just fly off if you have something, if something would if swing this or something, whatever. But this is kind of why we see this a lot, that when they went off to war, that they would bring this along with them. You also kind of have to think about that in that time, how feasible and shall we say like expensive was it to actually own a sword per se? And so like if certain people did not have the ability to have like the funds for that, well then they kind of brought the weapons and or shall we say the tools that they would need to take on their journey. And so I could definitely see them, a lot of people bringing this with them because I'm like, okay, hey, I'm a ranger I'm supposed to have my job to help with the army right here. You know, I'm my predominant weapon of choice is the bow, so I handle the range area. But if it comes to melee, you know, I happen to have a weapon that works and suffices what I need. And this definitely works adequately enough in a melee combat situation there. So these are the kind of the type of weapons that we see in the historical uh, context right here. And I definitely see as far as the Fantasy Ranger, I definitely think these will work. Is there a, another option that you could possibly improve on this? Well, there might just be. So, we kind of have an idea here, so we're kind of looking more for a blade, per se. Because, you know, like the idea of the axe, you know, while useful, in the areas, you know, the limited range right there, so we're looking for a blade, per se. Is there a sword that is a bit longer, that is profiled in a certain way, that can be useful in the form of chopping branches and defending yourself as a sword in combat? Well, yes, there is, and ironically, and I'm making this up, it's the Falchion. Yes! Oh, mwah! Get to say that. I think the best weapon for a medieval ranger would be a falchion. And, you know, it's not too hard to believe, you know, that, that if in the medieval period where, you know, the Germanic regions where the falchion was culturally appropriate, you know, that was their sidearm of choice, that it wouldn't surprise me that they had these archers that had their bow off in the wilderness with their falchions. Like, it is perfectly profiled. I wouldn't say perfectly, but it is, it is very optimized. If you haven't seen any of the other videos that I put about, this is kind of the main sword that I use for any sort of destruction test that I have. And you see that how light and nimble it is and how the profile of this makes it a great weapon to help chop and slice through stuff right here. Weirdly enough, the implements that you happen to see me use on this channel, that the typical getup that you see me wearing, just happens to be in my opinion, the optimization of what a ranger might actually be. Who would have thunk? This, yeah, typical stuff that you see me use. I got my falchion, you know, got my bow. What was that here? And here we go. Now this would be the typical gear that a typical ranger would use. Now, I do want to mention 
Uh, what is that again? That in this subject of being in melee, all right, now I want you to notice something here, okay? So we're, we're simulating a situation here, all right? So I'm a ranger. We've gotten into melee now. I, I had my, my longbow, you know, shooting off arrows, doing the stuff I needed to. The, the distance got closed up, and so I had to, like, to throw my bow down, and I pulled out my thousand, and we're getting into melee here. Does anyone notice anything about this? I have a free hand right here. So, like, what could I be best optimized of this, per se? Well, you know, you could leave it. You know, just leave it empty so that in that situation, whereas you're in combat and trying to get over there and you're parrying that you might you know, deflect a blade and trying to grab a hold of the arm and, you know, rest it out of the way so you could come back in and stab it. You definitely could if you wanted to. I think there are a little bit better ways to implement and make it more efficient. And so maybe you're saying, hey, how about a dagger? All right, now it goes a bit more data so you can parry and then stab in with this. This is definitely an option that I think uh, definitely could have worked back then. Don't have like extensive historical records of this, but I think this would definitely be a great combo for the ranger that they would use. I just want to comment on this glorious piece of crap that I have right here. Look at this thing right here. What is with this hole cut in the middle? It's got like teeth on the side. Like what the heck is this? It is a magnificent piece of garbage, but it is the only dagger that I have currently, so it will have to suffice right now. But, you know, so that's one option that you could have. So you could definitely leave it free and then quick pull out a dagger if you needed to. Definitely an option. However, in the historical side, there seems to be a more prominent uh, implement in the offhand weapon. And that is actually a buckler. I happen to have one. A buckler is this. Just a small little disc type shield right here. And as far as the... Uh, so, you know, this was very prominent in historical sense, and as far as the fantasy uh, version of it, you know, the optimization, I think this would also be one of the best things. You can handle defense as well, and you can be able to handle that and get into there. Because so you don't necessarily need to be defended from arrow fire, per se, like if you're in the forest, like as opposed to like carrying like one of these heavy things with you. Like, I mean, I have a... a rope here to have strap it onto your back if you need it, but geez, carrying this with you the whole time through the woods and also trying to use your bow getting into this, like this would just be a huge annoyance. So yeah, no. Shield like this, probably more efficient for the common soldier, but for the ranger, no. For the ranger, the small little buckler would be perfect. And, you know, being light and be more efficient for you to use in your equipment pack, you could just put it on your sword. This is generally, that's generally how I carry it with here, so if I can get this sword back into its sheath here. That, put the buckler, it's right there. Pretty easy to help carry around, and it doesn't weigh you down too much, and you can walk off and do the stuff you need to do. It doesn't get into the way of your doing your, your arrows firing, and then when you need to put it down, you can just pull this one up, draw your sword, and you're good to go. That was one option to think of that hasn't been talked about. And this is more prominent in, say, the uh, fantasy setting. Because in the historical accounts, generally as a ranger, uh, I guess we could use the word sort of like battalion, shall we say, you sort of have your own little group that you're a part of. And so when your ranger companions are firing off arrows and it happens to get into melee, you and your buddies all pull out your sword and buckler. Again, okay, I mean, I'm saying I'm your fellowship, you know, whether it be the bill hook or an axe or, you know, whatever you happen to have, your weapon of choice, that you would have your weapon and your buckler and you would fight together as a unit and work together as a team to help defend each other. When it comes to the idea of saying you're the solitary defense of the woodlands, you know, like you're by yourself, when it's on one-on-one -on -one sort of duel, or maybe even one-on-two, the buckler definitely would be one of the best things to have. When suddenly it becomes multiple assailants around you, then maybe the buckler might not be the best thing to have with you. Then this would probably be having, this would be having a weapon. This would definitely be the best one to have you. But however, when you do have, are surrounded by enemies, 
maybe having a little bit of a longer reaching weapon might be a little bit better. So in this particular case, maybe you can actually get the benefit of having certain devices where you want to have a good brush cutting tool and you want to have a good tree cutting tool. So maybe in this case, you actually do have a sword and an axe. Or maybe in the context of saying that the, the particular ranger that you have is of the class that can't really afford a sword. So maybe, just set this down. Maybe, has, whoa, easy there, it's gonna fall off. Maybe he has a bill hook and an axe. And that these are his uh, particular weapons that in a particular instance that he can pull these out and defend himself. Very possible. What is the full optimization of this? Well, probably would be in a situation of multiple assailants, might be best to have two falchions. And oh yes, here we go. This would be something that would be utterly cool and badass. Do we have any historical references for this? I, I doubt it, but this comes the idea of like, maybe having two falchions on you, which is weird because in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, the kind of the, some of the archetypes of the ranger is dual wielding, oddly enough. So, I guess Dungeons and Dragons got something right there, so hey. And this is, you know, pretty much the idea of what I think the ranger will be taking off in the battle here. Then, this is a forest ranger. Now we gotta talk about rangers in the context of the forest removed out of the equation. Does that change anything? I think it does. If you saw the video about medieval foresters, then you probably understand that you know, when a king or noble declared a land to be you no know, royal forest under his protection, did not necessarily need to be woodlands, per se. It could be you no know, hills for pasturing cattle if they wanted to. It could be flat grassland for growing crops. And if this was a type of land that a lord wanted to protect, and it was on the edge of his territory, and he wanted to make sure everything was safe and not anyone was doing any raids or doing any nefarious business onto it, he would want to send men out on the frontier to help protect it. Again, the ranging over the countryside, I would still believe this qualifies as the ranger, just the sort of type of job description has been changed a little bit right here. Now, does that change the typical armaments that a typical ranger would use? A little bit, I think. If you're out in the open flatland area, do you necessarily need to have the bow, per se? I know that bows would be fantastic for range, per se, but, you know, like, without the idea of having cover for anything, you can see the enemy, you know, approaching if they happen to. It would have to be more of, like, an actual party, you know, like a good raiding party to do any sort of real damage, shall we say, as opposed to, like, that individual, like, a band, a couple or two bandits. So, being the... Uh, ranger, shall we say, again, having in the, the open area that can run around, you know, being able to loose arrows over there, you know, toss up, you know, like it could be beneficial or it could be not, but considering the all-around package, we'll get to that, I think that the bow may not actually be the best type of weapon here. So, we're going to set this aside here. Here we go. So, what would be some of the uh, best uh, gear that a particular ranger in this setting would use? Well, first off, would padded armor be the best option? Well, it definitely would be light, and you could definitely travel around using it. So there is, you know, that. But the idea of having more of a physical confrontation seems more likely. Granted, you could probably throw up some ideas of like arrow fire being exchanged but in a flat open area where everything can see what's going on the idea of trying to surprise the enemy or get things you know going on or like the idea of getting more physical probably seems to be the more likely of the options so would actually padded armor be the best option weirdly enough i actually think that mail armor might actually be a bit better in this situation right here. 
Now, you know, you have to figure out the idea that, you know, like, male armor does weigh a little bit more. So you have to figure, like, okay, so if you're out on the range, you know, the range, shall we say, and you're, you know, fighting, you know, like, does it wear you down a little bit? But also, you're not in the woods, so you're not trying to surround around through the shrubbery. You know, it's a little bit more easier for you. But, you know, let's say if you do have male armor, you know, for me, this doesn't weigh a thing on for me because this is just a uh, printed... Uh, T that I have right here. By the way, shout out to Shadowversity uh, and Teespring. This is where I got this uh, armor right here. They also have uh, hoodies as well, so you can look like you have a male coif on your head, so look out for that. But, you know, like, if you have male armor, it's a lot more protection in the physical competition. Let's see if I can strap on my other stuff right here. Let's go. You can have on to your sword. But even if you did have, like, say, padded armor, regardless of that, uh, you would definitely want to have uh, sufficient protection to help from arrow fire, regardless of whether even even if it was male uh, armor or not. So I think a shield would definitely be useful, uh, even if you had male armor. But definitely, if you had cloth armor, you could definitely still use uh, the padded gambeson if you wanted to. But in that case, definitely implement an actual shield as opposed to like a small buckler. So already, you know, we're thinking about, hmm, armor seems to have been a bit changed. The buckler has been increased in size. What else is being changed right here? Well, in this particular instance, if we're bothering to have something like this, we've already kind of seen that we you know like the, the, the bow and arrow was a bit difficult to use with this. And also maybe the options of using bows might not be quite feasible in this open location. So what would you handle? Like, if you, if you can't have the reach of arrows, well then, what other weapons with reach would you want? Well, I would have the king of weapons, and that is... the spear. Ever since we decided to hunt woolly mammoths for food, this has been, like, the weapon of choice throughout history. And just looking at how much range we have right here, I don't see or right there, so, like, I can easily put the pointy end into the other man, a lot easier if they don't if they do not have that much of a ranged weapon right there. So already we're kind of switching things up a bit right here. That this the spear uh, it can be utilized utilitarian. Like if you need on the path and you're walking around, it can be used as a walking stick. Help you out there. Uh, if it goes into a civilian uh, dispute, is you know like if you're protecting your near more the area where their farmland is, you know you can use it as sort of like a Weapon, not only a weapon, shall we say, but a, a device implemented to, you know, like, help prevent arguments, shall we say. You can use the staff to help, you know, clear, you know, grass out of the way, or you can use the blade if you need to. It can be thrown as well. You know, a lot of uses for the spear. And this would look like what I would think would be, would be much closer to what the ranger would use in a situation when there isn't really forest around, per se. Again, would the falchion be the more typical sidearm of choice? Again, it kind of seems a little bit anachronistic, because we kind of had this whole, looks like this whole Anglo-Saxon vibe going on right here, that we have this sort of male uh, armor, I got my spear, and I've got my shield, but then all of a sudden I have a falchion. Like, would that Definitely, like, I was thinking we'd want to have, like, more of, like, a Viking-style era sword to go with it. Now, of course, in, you know, medieval fantasy, you know, you can kind of get away with certain things of, like, oh, cultures, you know, like, they're blended, and, you know, reasons, you know, it's not fully historically accurate, you can get away with it. But, and, you know, also, on the subject, you know, like, of clearing brush, per se, not really high on the priority, so then you know, maybe having an actual sword, per se. So, here you go. Let's see if I can put that down there, see if that'll stay. Behave. So in this case, we might actually be bringing this uh, arming sword back here. Here we go. Who to thunk? And we have our arming sword here. There we go. We have our shield, and we have our spear. The only thing missing would be a helmet. And by the way. For the Forestry Ranger as well, that would also definitely be a necessity. I don't know what it is with Hollywood and movies thinking that people don't need helmets, but that they think they have enough plot armor to go around and that they're fine 
it's, it's a pet peeve of mine, but I know. But yes, helmets, both in historical context and just practicality, helmets very useful. But, you know, as far as the ranger of the, the planes, shall we say, this seems to be like what the typical gear would be. Uh, another thing we consider is considering the this might be a little bit much more gear than normal as opposed to the forest rangers so you're carrying a lot more weight on you so much more hardier individual but then again if you must kind of be if you're doing a more melee you know fighting but one thing to consider that in as far as the historical context goes probably a little bit implausible and that is would be the most expensive thing in your arsenal, not including the army, the armor, like, like this, which would be expensive enough, but if you could actually own a horse, then you could uh, use the horse as most of the grunt of bearing most of the weight, you no, know, granted the armor is still on you, but most of the weight is now carrying on the horse. You also have the added mobility of, of range that you can run all over the place. If it does get into physical contact, you have the height and, and the use mobility of a horse, which is fantastic. You're practically a cavalry unit right now. So, you know, the historical side, could, like, the average ranger own a horse? Mm, I don't know. But, you know, so some sort of a fantasy setting, you know, you could probably get away with it. And, oddly enough, what we got here, if we come with the idea of, you know, like, mail and helmets, we got my spear and my sword on my side. I got my round shield right here, and I'm on a horse. Kinda sounds quite a bit what J.R.R. Tolkien describes the Rohirrim as, which you no, know, you know, fair to him, you know, because like, he did his research. But I just kind of find it ironic that you know, like these horse lords, you know, that ranging all over the plains, they have their own little homesteads, and you know, whenever they hear the horn call, that they could be summoned and form an army together to protect their lands. Who knew? Oddly enough, we have, you know, we have the Gondorian Rangers, and then we have the Rohan Rangers, you know, by God. We never, don't think we necessarily call them Rangers, but I think they kind of fit that, that bill right there. So, fun little things that we learned here. As far as, you know, flatlands are concerned, regardless of whether it be grass or a desert or, you know, like the snow, you know, generally probably would be about the same. The... In the, the, in the tundra, you know, might be a little bit different. I don't know if you would have male armor per se. Just probably just layer up on like thick clothing and by, by having that many layers to keep yourself warm, you're basically getting enough layers like a gambeson that it protects you enough. Uh, as far as the desert, if things are getting too hot, you know, the idea of then maybe, you know, like have more like loose fabric as well. But uh, interestingly enough, when I think of the, the desert, I kind of think of Arabia, so in this particular case, maybe not like a center grip shield per se, but you probably have more like a smaller strapped shield, and in this case, hey, maybe not like a typical arming sword, but maybe you have, you know, like a, 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 a shamshir or a killage or, by the way, I have no idea what the heck this weapon is. It's got the handle of a tulwar, it's got the straight blade right here of a shamshir that eventually curves up, but it's got a clipped back point of a killage. So I have no idea what the heck this is. But I think it's cool, it's a training sword, I spray painted it, and this is what we got. Uh, ironically, weirdly enough, this would actually be uh, one of the better curved swords for cutting through brush, because like the Falchion, it has a concentration of mass at the tip right there. So it's not like a full, just a little saber right there that generally narrows down to the point and has more weight at the end. So this actually probably would be a good one for your Arabian style ranger. So, hey, there you go. But this has been the subject of the ranger here. Fun little things that we learn here at Falcon. I uh, think that pretty much concludes everything talking about the ranger here. Uh, this is sort of uh, an impromptu video that I made because I talked about the medieval foresters and I kind of was excited enough about that that I decided to make a separate video just on the ranger per se. Uh, if you kind of like this, I might do other videos on certain classes, you know, like, like say, like, like, the Barbarian, you know, like, or the Rogue, you know, like, what they might be, you know, bring along with them, so who knows, I might do something like that. Uh, the actual next video, because I'm still on this Ranger high that I want to know, is actually going to be about the most famous Ranger in history and folklore that we kind of love to talk about, and that's Robin Hood. Yes! Talking about the... 
uh, adventures that he has, some of the, uh, the original records, you know, did he actually exist in history with some of the tales that we have, what actually happened, is there any historical basis for him being an actual person, what happened there, so that might be a bit fun. Also talking about the uh, cinematic portrayals there, because I kind of uh, I love the, the media and I love, you know, storytelling. So I'd love to see how certain people portray the uh, stories of Robin Hood there and see what exactly they adapt into the story, what they keep, what they don't. Are they kind of certain faithful to what the, the books and you know, the tales say or not? But I don't think that would be a kind of a fun video. Look out for that one. So until next time, keep a watchful eye.